Hey, and welcome to Sheboygan. We, we timed it perfectly for middle of January on Lake Michigan. It's, it's beautiful weather, beautiful day, and thanks for, thanks for making the journey to be here. We're really excited. This is our first annual Eat Wisconsin Fish Summit. Um, we're excited to have a variety of different people coming from different perspectives here. The point of today is really to get people together who are interested in local Wisconsin fish and start talking about some of the issues surrounding local fish, maybe some of the obstacles, barriers, um, questions that people have. It's really a day for um, to learn and then also we want to learn from you. So the afternoon is basically dedicated to panels and discussion and that's what we want it to be. We, uh, we are going to do some presentations in the, in this morning to give some people who maybe aren't familiar with what types of local fish we have, um, uh, how is it to be a commercial fisherman on the Great Lakes, uh, uh, fish farmers in Wisconsin. So we want to give some background information and then after our uh, white fish lunch, <laughs> we will um, we'll be uh, having our panels up here. So thanks so much for coming. Um, by the way, my name is Kathy Klein and I am the Education Outreach Specialist for the UW Sea Grant Institute. Before I explain why we have a Sea Grant Institute in Wisconsin, because people get a little confused about that sometimes, I just want to thank um, our sponsors, Sea Grant, one of them, but also uh, the Wisconsin Department of uh, Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. We applied for a Buy Local, Buy Wisconsin grant, and they granted it to us, so we're happy. That's what's supporting this workshop and our reception later on tonight, late this afternoon at the Lakeshore Culinary Institute. So thank you for DACCAP to, uh, to supporting this local food initiative. And also thanks to our producers who are here and also donated fish for our reception tonight. So Bailey's Harbor Fish Company, uh, 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 All Natural Greens and Marinette, um, our perch, uh, Bodine Fishery from Bayfield, and then uh, Dairyland Shrimp <laughs> from Westby, Wisconsin. Yes, we have a shrimp farm in Wisconsin. So we have our own local shrimp. Believe it or not, things are happening in Wisconsin. And also a little bit about Sea Grant because that's who I work for and that's why we're here. Um, uh, sea Grant, uh, there's a Sea Grant program in every coastal state in the United States. It's usually associated with the university. We're associated with the entire UW system. Our main office is in UW-Madison. Uh, every coastal state, yes, we are a coastal state. We have two Great Lakes surrounding us. That's what makes us a Sea Grant program. So every Great Lakes state has a Sea Grant program as well. And uh, we can prove that because we have somebody from Michigan Sea Grant here who will be talking later on, Ron. Uh, so this is just showing all of our Sea Grant programs. And our main, our main job is to support research. So we support research on Lake Michigan, Lake Superior. And then we also uh, support education and outreach around that research. So we're funding the research and then also trying to get the results of that research out to the people who can use it. So why are we here to talk about fish today? We're also part of NOAA. NOAA supports us. Uh, NOAA has a big interest in fisheries in the United States. Um, and we're trying to bring that to a very local level here in Wisconsin, so our Wisconsin local fisheries. So why are we here to talk about fish? <laughs> it's great. Uh, it's, a, it's a healthy, healthy protein source, first of all. That's where we're going to start with today. Fish is a healthy thing to eat. For the first time, the new, new dietary guidelines from the federal government just came out. Okay, so not everybody plans all their meals based on the U.S. dietary guidelines, but it is a starting point, and a lot of things do stem from it, like what's included in school lunch programs, for instance. Uh, and so for the first time, the U.S. dietary guidelines has said, hey, uh, fish is very healthy protein source. Why not consider swapping out two servings of meat or poultry a week with seafood? Um, it doesn't sound that you know, dramatic, but it is a big dramatic move for the federal government to say that. So that just came out recently. Um, why not include more of your protein sources from seafood? So um, I'll just go back to here. So seafood uh, has, it's rich in minerals and vitamins. It's good for your heart. It has omega-3 fatty acids in it, which is uh, it's the main dietary source of omega-3 fatty acids, which uh, research study after research study has shown is very beneficial for um, our brains, most importantly. So, uh, and why Wisconsin fish? And what does Wisconsin fish mean? And what does local mean in Wisconsin? 
Um, Brett Shaw is a researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison from the uh, Department of Life, Science, Life Sciences Communication. He recently um, completed a study doing some surveys on what, what does local mean to people in, in Wisconsin. And uh, he found out local means Wisconsin. Um, uh, just some, some basic results there. Uh, local doesn't necessarily mean the Midwest. People in Wisconsin really want to purchase things from Wisconsin. That's, that's what's most important to them. So Brett's going to be presenting this later on um, during the, the Wisconsin Local Food Summit, which our workshop is kind of kicking off right now. Um, and the reception tonight is kind of the official kickoff for for the Wisconsin Local Food Summit. That's why we chose to be here in Sheboygan for this meeting. We wanted to tie in with that local food uh, workshop. So more from Brett later on about that. Um, and this is just going back again about uh, the, the main things about why fish is, is uh, a, a healthy thing to eat, the vitamins and minerals. It's lower fat, lower calorie source of protein, and those omega-3s. Um, so why U.S. fish? Seafood is important, it's good to be eating fish, but people really should be eating fish from the United States. A big reason why, and a lot of people don't realize, and we found in, in working on this project, um, a lot of people, this really resonated, that more than 90% of the seafood that we're eating in the United States right now comes from outside of the United States. So we are importing a huge amount of seafood into this country. It's a gigantic trade deficit. Um, we have, obviously, local suppliers here in the United States. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we should be purchasing our seafood from our own producers in the United States. And just a little bit about what that imported seafood looks like. Where is it coming from? Um, a large portion of it is coming from China, uh, Canada. We import a lot of fish from Canada. Um, and then going down Thailand, Indi Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, Chile, um, that's kind of where the, the, but the, you can definitely see the main, um, the main suppliers there. And then what is the seafood that we're importing? Um, we really love shrimp in the United States. I'm sure that's no surprise to you. A lot of people don't like seafood or say that they don't like seafood. They'll eat shrimp. Uh, salmon is another big one. Um, so, you know, the seafood that we're eating in the United States right now, not too diversified. We, we could really, um, you know, spread out and start enjoying some different species. And uh, so why buy, why buy local fish? Um, you know, we're kind of taking it to the U.S. level, but bringing it into Wisconsin, um, people are starting to get more and more serious about their local food. Um, the, the local food movement with produce has been going on for quite a while now. This is, uh, this is a report that was, that was recently released um, from the National Restaurant Association, I think, and they they polled about 1,500 chefs from the American Culinary Institute about what are the top, the top 10 trends that they see coming up for 2016. So the number one there is locally sourced meat and seafood. Um, now that people have kind of figured out some of the hurdles of sourcing local food, local produce, um, kind of that next step is taking it to the protein sources, which can be much more complicated and difficult for, for a lot of reasons. We'll, we'll tackle some of those later on today about uh, you know, what makes protein different than, than some of our, um, our produce. But the demand is there. Chefs are watching. They're interested. Um, so you know, now's the time for producers to connect with the people who want this food. So <laughs> um, when we started talking about uh, local fish a couple of years ago, and we started thinking about this project, and we started talking to some consumers, we did some surveys, and uh, uh, what we found is that some people would say, well, sure, I love fish, and, and I love local fish, because I go out for fish every Friday. <laughs> of course, that's what we do in Wisconsin. Uh, we love our fish fries. I love our fish fries. I mean, most people who I know have their own favorite fish fry in different places. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't think about when they go out for that fish fry, what are they most likely eating if they're not in Green Bay or Sheboygan or if they're in Madison, chances are they're eating cod. <laughs> uh, we love cod now in Wisconsin. And, you know, it fries up really well. It makes a good fish fry. Um, it is not from Wisconsin. <laughs> Um, and just a lot of people don't make that connection. They think, I, I do eat fish. I, I'm a really good fish eater. Um, so we have a lot of water in, in Wisconsin. We're rich in groundwater. We're rich in our Great Lakes. Um, 
uh, people have, I would say, I would make the case that a lot of people have lost their connection to these Great Lakes, to our water resources, because we're not eating our local fish so much anymore. We have a long history of those fish fries that we used to have on Friday used to be <coughs> white fish. They used to be perch out of Lake Michigan. People were very connected to those fish. Um, we're not, you know, for Titus will talk a little bit about why we're not getting perch from Lake Michigan right now, but a lot of things have happened to the Great Lakes. Um, it's tough for commercial fishermen. There have been a lot of changes. But I would make the case that it's really important for us not to give up on the Great Lakes um, or to give up on our local fish resources because there's really no closer way that somebody can be connected to our water resources, I would argue, than to eat fish raised with those water resources or from those bodies of water themselves. Uh, a lot of people go fishing in Wisconsin, but you know, not everybody does. Uh, people who go out and make their own catch and eat that fish, they feel very connected to that body of water. But for the people who aren't going out fishing or can't get out on Lake Michi Michigan to go fishing, being able to go to a restaurant in Wisconsin or to a grocery store and buy fish from that body of water that we claim as our own in Wisconsin, that's a big deal. And I think that's something that we should support and, and make available to people. So uh, that's why I make the case for local fish. Um, I think that, that it's very important for our state identity, who we are, and what we believe in. And here are some of the people, the faces behind that local fish. Um, this is uh, Halverson's Fishery up in Cornucopia, Wisconsin. We've had Great Lakes fishermen, people, families uh, fishing on the Great Lakes since you know, the early 1800s. That's a, a very old industry in Wisconsin. Those are people who uh, work very hard and are also, um, they're, they're preserving that maritime history on, our, on the shores of Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. And our Wisconsin fish farms. Uh, we've been raising fish in Wisconsin for just as, probably as long as there's been a state. <laughs> Um, uh, our Wisconsin fish farms can be, they're very different when you think about aquaculture throughout the world. We'll talk a little bit more about aquaculture. But uh, raising fish in Wisconsin is very different than raising fish in Thailand for many, many reasons. Um, a lot of people don't know that there is a lot of local fish available in Wisconsin that's raised on local farms. So we want to be able, um, we want people to know about this fish source as well. And mostly this summit is about trying to reconnect the people of Wisconsin to their local fish. So uh, we've been working with some restaurants to bring that local fish back in. This is Braze in Milwaukee. Um, they've been big supporters of ours, bringing in both um, wild uh, Great Lakes caught fish and Wisconsin farm raised fish as well. And then I'm just gonna go over, we're gonna have, um, Titus is gonna do a talk about uh, commercial fishing and uh, Emma's going to do a talk on, on Wisconsin fish farms, but just to give you, you know, introduce you to your Wisconsin fish. <laughs> so you know what fish we're talking about here. Here's our commercially caught Great Lakes fish. Um, some things that, that uh, well, I guess I'll let Titus kind of get more into, into depth with, <laughs> with his friends. <laughs> and our Wisconsin farm raised fish. And like I said, there's Pacific white shrimp, a, a new species. Um, saw guy is something that we're working on. Uh, we're doing research right now um, at the Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility, um, coming up with new species to raise in Wisconsin. Um, and here's you know, yellow perch right here. Uh, people have a deep connection with yellow perch. It used to be in our fish fries quite a bit. Now we're raising it on farms. And a little bit about Eat Wisconsin Fish. We started this a couple years ago just to start figuring out how to get the word out about local fish. So this is the, the next step in, in this project. But we started off with just a, sm a small pilot program working with um, the Seafood Center in Madison to do some messaging about local fish. Uh, there's uh, some, some farm-raised rainbow trout. Uh, labeling it as Wisconsin raised fish just to let people know that this fish is out there. They can buy it. Um, as you've seen in the back of the room, we, we've tried to come up with some promotional information. We have a great graphic designer who's been working on this message about Eat Wisconsin Fish, so we've been trying to get the word out that way. And uh, hopefully you picked up a local buying guide. Um, that's supported by DACAP as well. We just finished that. It's hot off the press. Uh, we worked with our producers. So this is a buying guide that a chef or a retailer, somebody who wants to start sourcing local fish for their business, 
kind of look through this guide to see what's available and from whom. Um, it's, it's basically a starting point. We're going to be moving it onto the web as well. So there's a little comment card in there. We're hoping if you see anything or if you have any comments about any of this uh, workshop today, feel free to write it on the comment card, drop it off at the registration, or take it home with you. You can pop it in the mail too. Um, we'd love to hear from you because we're, we're, uh, this is all about the consumer, it's all about the retail, it's all about the producer. Um, we want to hear your ideas. Uh, just a little bit about our messaging there, um, trying to get local fish back on the menus in Wisconsin. And I'm going to, to uh, stop there because <laughs> I'm going to try and keep us on schedule. Um, and I'm going to introduce Titus Seilhammer, who's our fisheries specialist from UWC Grant, and he's going to tell you everything that you've ever wanted to know about Great Lakes commercial fishing in 20 minutes. <laughs> Well, now, I'm not sure I can get everything. Uh, I am not, in fact, a commercial fisherman. And we do have commercial fishermen in the audience. And we will have a panel later in the day uh, where they're going to tell you what they do. Uh, and you can ask them questions. And I think that's a great opportunity for everyone. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I am a scientist. I'm a fisheries, uh, fisheries specialist with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Uh, and I'm a trained scientist. Uh, and I've studied fish. So. Uh, really, I will unfortunately give you a few graphs. Uh, there'll be some data in here, uh, but really I want to kind of give a, a very broad overview of uh, sort of the importance of Great Lakes fish through time. Uh, so, uh, you know, here we are, the Great Lakes, uh, a very globally unique uh, freshwater system uh, with a, a, a lot of fish. And really our, our connection to fish goes back thousands of years. The Great Lakes have produced fish and provided fish to people uh, for several thousand years. Uh, and that goes back to the, the Native Americans who uh, you know, took advantage of the very abundant uh, freshwater resources that we had in the Great Lakes and in Wisconsin. And as uh, the uh, new arrivals came to North America, uh, settled the United States, settled Canada uh, through time, uh, Great Lakes fish were uh, continued to be uh, very important. Um, so early on, if we look at the fishery, uh, it was really utilizing those uh, sort of close to shore, easy to access fish. Uh, so upper left there, we've got the seine fishery. A seine is basically uh, a large net, weights on the bottom, floats on top, and you can go from shore, you can circle around fish, pull both sides of the net in, and you've harvested the fish. Uh, so that's a, uh, you know, still a, a research tool that we use today, but not really a, a commercial fishing tool uh, that's used. And uh, you know, really provided access, uh, fairly low investment is required to you know, take this net and catch fish on shore. Uh, as time went on, uh, sort of the, the fishery changed, uh, and the, the fishery also shifted offshore. So, uh, you know, accessing fish farther from shore, uh, things like pond nets uh, right here, uh, gill nets also used. And I'll uh, describe some of those uh, tools when we talk about the, the current fishery a little later on. Uh, but, you know, really the, the, the changing of the fishery through time, the evolution of uh, the different gears that are used, and also the, the evolution of the technology that's used. You know, we start out here. We start out on shore, maybe with uh, rowboats accessing those near shore fish. Uh, we move to more sail powered boats. We're getting offshore, uh, you know, pulling in larger nets uh, farther from land. Uh, and then our, our vessels are evolving. Uh, so larger vessels are being used, uh, uh, you know, powered vessels. So we, we shift away from sail power to uh, motorized boats. Uh, and that allows for access to different fisheries. Um, so an example here, uh, we're looking at the commercial fishery of Lake Michigan uh, through time. So 18, 1870s to uh, 2005, uh, and just looking at changes. And you know, each, each color here is representing a different species. Uh, and you know, we can really see sort of the heyday uh, back in the, the late 1800s, uh, you know, some very high catch, 
total, so 45 million pounds, uh, with the, the fishery really being dominated. Uh, you know, sort of early on, we've got the importance of whitefish. Uh, so we've got whitefish uh, early on, uh, lake trout. We've got the chubs and herring, and just the chubs down here, yellow for yellow perch. Uh, we move through time, the, the whitefish declines, the landings decline for a long time. Uh, but really a, a herring and chub dominated fishery uh, and very high, uh, high catch, uh, so high lake trout as well, and uh, perch. Uh, you know, sort of declines through time uh, here into the, the mid-1900s, uh, and we have shifts uh, with uh, an increase in catch here in the, the mid-1900s, uh, mid but here we see that uh, sort of loss of the fishery for lake trout, uh, and chubs really carrying a lot of the fishery. Uh, and then we've got our yellow through time, and right there, our yellow perch, that's where our uh, Lake Michigan yellow perch fishery is closed. Uh, so, you know, really it's a, it's a story of change through time, uh, and if we look at sort of the, the current fishery, uh, even back in 2005, really dominated by whitefish, and that's, that's the story that we'll see uh, looking at the sort of the current, Wisconsin's current commercial, commercial fishery, uh, really dominated by uh, whitefish these days. Uh, so, uh, interesting story though, and this, when we look at, you know, why the fishery has changed through time, uh, invasive species have really been a, an important uh, factor in that, and this is just uh, alewife harvest. And uh, if we look at uh, the commercial alewife harvest, if we add that in, we actually see overall very high biomass being harvested from the lake. But we, what we have is a shift from these uh, you know, fish that we can eat to fish that we really can't eat and fish that aren't uh, native to the Great Lakes. So uh, really uh, changing, uh, changing food web uh, changes over time and you know, overall this uh, sort of a decline in the, the total production uh, in the lake. And you know, what the decline, uh, there's no there's no single reason uh, for that. You know, I think it's uh, easy to say, well, the fish, the commercial fishing went down, that's because of overfishing. Uh, but not, that's not the answer. It really, it's uh, all five of these. So as we moved into Wisconsin, we settled the Great Lakes, and as we settled the region, uh, or the region was settled, uh, the land was developed. Uh, dams were built. So dams were built for uh, power, uh, to uh, really take advantage of the, the areas that we had. Uh, habitat was destroyed. Uh, lumber, mining, agriculture, all changing the landscape uh, over time and really affecting the available habitat that was there for those fish. Uh, pollution, you know, uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. Uh, a long time, you know, sort of the that's the idea, that's how we dealt with it, and uh, as we continue to deal with things like PCB contamination uh, in the river sediments, uh, those did not dilute, they're still there. Uh, and really a, a very large role here uh, of invasive species. So the sea lamprey, the alewife, the zebra and quagga mussels have really changed the, the food web that we have in Lake Michigan, uh, particularly, where you know we have sort of a, this is a different lake than 50 years ago than 100 years ago. And uh, you know, where we go in the future really depends on uh, a lot of these invasive, invasive species driven uh, food web changes. So in terms of the fishery today, uh, we can look at, uh, this is just uh, Great Lakes wide. We can see uh, you know, overall uh, the Canadian side of Lake Erie provides uh, quite a bit of the total catch in the Great Lakes. Um, Lake Erie is shallow, it's a lot warmer, it's more productive, and it can produce more fish. Uh, so lots of the fish coming out of here tend to be uh, uh, small fish, or smaller fish than we have uh, in Lake Michigan. So perch, walleye, uh, smelt, uh, some of the, the, the big producing fish out of Lake Erie. Uh, but also, uh, we see an importance here of Lake Michigan in the fishery, you can see that big spike here from the, the alewife years. Um, and, uh, you know, overall, it's, it's been fairly stable now. Harvests are, uh, you know, holding steady. Uh, this is uh, some more recent numbers, uh, 2013. 
Looking at total catch, this is combined uh, Canada and the United States. Uh, looking at by species, uh, Lake Whitefish, uh, really the, the dominant overall species harvested from the Great Lakes, representing the, the largest uh, uh, catch total. This is uh, pounds and uh, the highest value, uh, about, I guess, about $17 million. Um, uh, followed closely by the perch and walleye, and this is really where, uh, where the uh, Canadian side of the lake, uh, Lake Erie, comes in. Uh, pretty much all this walleye is coming out of Lake Erie. Most of this perch is coming out of uh, Lake Erie as well on the Canadian side. Uh, and then some other uh, species, lake herring and other species that we have uh, in the, the Lake Superior waters of Wisconsin, uh, lake trout as well, uh, to a lesser degree. So. Uh, you know, when we look at Wisconsin's uh, commercial fishery today, uh, it's really a, a story about whitefish uh, for the most part. So, uh, you know, the, the current state of the fishery, it's uh, very closely managed and regulated. And, I, you know, we can talk to commercial fishermen and, you know, they have to deal with a lot of different regulations uh, and rules. Uh, and I think overall, what we're looking at is, uh, you know, trying to have a, a sustainable fishery and providing fish into the future. Um, there's a, a limited entry system, so there's only a certain number of uh, commercial fishing licenses that are available. Uh, uh, several of the species are fished on quotas, so you can look at the, the population size. This is uh, how large the population size is in Lake Michigan, say, for whitefish, and then the quota is set. This is the sort of amount of fish that can be harvested and uh, that's then divided up among the licenses. Um, uh, also restrictions on the different types of fishing gear that can be used, time of the year, uh, open seasons, and that's how uh, the fisheries are really managed. Uh, in terms of a gear type, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about the species, but what about how are they caught? I think that's uh, you know something interesting to know about your fishery to better understand it. Uh, trap nets. This is uh, one of the gear types available. So uh, a large, uh, in sort of live uh, in entrainment gear. Uh, it become the fish will basically swim. We've got long leads. We've got wings, and the fish will swim into these, and they get corralled into the pot uh, right here. And then they swim around until uh, until. Uh, or a trap net boat comes out, uh, lift the nets up. So we've got buoys out in the water, uh, marking different parts of the net. Uh, the pot is pulled over the back of the trap net boat, uh, which uh, pushes all the fish to one side. Uh, here's a bunch of white fish uh, coming out of Lake Michigan. Uh, and then they're sorted. So you can dip, the net, dip those uh, fish out, sort them. This is a, a lake trout right here. So lake trout, not looking for those. Tossed back into the lake, you can swim away. Uh, smaller whitefish, also tossed out. Uh, and they can grow to be larger so we can eat them later on. Uh, this, is, uh, this is our the catch here. So we've got whitefish coming out of the net. Um, and just a, a view of some different uh, buoys that are out there. Uh, another gear type, gill net. So gill nets uh, have been a, a, an available gear type for a, a very long time. Uh, the, the nets now made out of monofilament, so the fish don't see them. They swim into them, and they get entangled in those nets. Uh, the fish can then be uh, pulled up. We've got uh, different fish tugs here. Uh, you can fish in winter, in summer, uh, but then again, you know, it depends on uh, where the different gear types are allowed. Uh, so head out on the lake. Uh, here's uh, some of the technology, uh, you know, a very old technology at this point, but a hydraulic lifter to help bring those gill nets into the, into the boat. So rather than, you know, in the 1800s, you may have pulled these in by hand. Uh, now there's a, an assistant there to, to bring that in. Uh, this is a set of gill nets here. This is for chub fishing. So, you know, one of the different ways to target different species is to use different size mesh. So smaller mesh, you'll catch smaller fish. Larger mesh, uh, if you were fishing for whitefish, you would have a, a larger mesh size, larger hole, so your whitefish would swim into that. 
uh, setting nets in different places and different depths at different times uh, can help uh, you know, target the, the species that you want to catch. Uh, this is a, a chub fishery here, so a small, uh, small mesh size. Chubs come in uh, right there on the board and eventually smoked and we can uh, enjoy those uh, smoked chubs. Uh, trawling, sort of a, a limited, limited gear type uh, in the Great Lakes, but there is some trawling. Uh, so basically bat dragging a large net uh, through the midwater or along the bottom and uh, catching the fish that are, that are there. Um, uh, different trawlers. Uh, we've got a, a large drum here that rolls that net up as it's put in the water. Now here's the net coming in. Um, and that, uh, you know, a more mobile gear type uh, that can, uh, you know, catch, catch the fish where they're at instead of setting things and waiting for the, the fish to come in. So in terms of Wisconsin's commercial harvest, uh, what does it look like? Uh, so I've got some 2013 values here. Uh, this is the, the total harvest for Wisconsin waters of Lake Michigan in 2013. Uh, over 90% of that is uh, the whitefish. Uh, so we're a, a very much a, a whitefish area now. Um, lesser degree, there's uh, yellow perch coming out of Green Bay. There is a, a perch fishery in Green Bay uh, with a, a small quota there. But again, the Lake Michigan fishery for perch, that's been closed since the mid-90s. Um, and you know, if we look at why that, you know, there are very limited fish fishing effort for that perch now, even on the recreational side, and uh, that perch fishery just hasn't come back. And, you know, the, the reasons, you know, probably related, most likely related to invasive species and uh, the, the zebra and quagga mussels changing the food web and making it really hard for uh, perch to survive in Lake Michigan. Uh, smelt, uh, small amount of smelt, uh, chubs, uh, some chub fishing uh, and burbot. Uh, and really we've seen, uh, you know, sort of a shift away from uh, catching some of these uh, smelt and chubs. Uh, again, probably changes in population, but also changes in the lake. Uh, you know, the, the water's very clear now. If you're a small fish, like the, uh, the rainbow smelt, coming into through the very clear waters of uh, near shore Lake Michigan is going to be a problem. So uh, do we have small populations or have uh, some of these fish shifted into really the deeper waters? And, you know, questions there about, you know, lake-wide what's happening uh, to the food web and, you know, in the future what's that food web going to look like? Uh, lake Superior, uh, again, a large portion here uh, of whitefish being caught, but uh, Cisco also, the lake herring uh, right here, providing a, a large chunk of that. But that's a very seasonal fishery and really driven by the eggs, uh, which there's a, a very large market for the eggs uh, going over to Scandinavia. Uh, some, the Siskoet, which are the fat lake trout and the lake trout as well, chubs, uh, and some some of the bourbon. I put bourbon up here because we will have, uh, I we're going to have bourbon on the menu later, I think. Yes? Yes. yes. So bourbon, uh, our only freshwater cod species, um, and uh, it's a tasty fish. So maybe not much to look at. Uh, so the, the future, you know, we're, we're having continued uh, management uh, into the future uh, to sustain the fisheries. Um, you know, questions, what's going to happen with, with total production? Uh, what are uh, potential changes? Uh, you know, certainly climate change and warming of the waters uh, could change our fisheries. This is a, a recent study, and what it's just looking at is recent uh, days and of the temperature preference for these different species just between 1979 and 2006. So not even projecting into the future, but just looking at uh, changes through time, and we actually see uh, for some of these species, walleye, uh, Chinook salmon, lean lake trout, uh, are seeing actually more habitat area in Lake Superior. Lake Superior very deep, very cold, um, and so warming, actually increasing some of this habitat for some of these species, uh, Siskoet lake trout, uh, maybe declining. That's uh, more of a deep, 
deep water species. Um, so, you know, it's just really another story of changing lakes. Uh, you know, the, the food web, the ecology is changing, uh, and I think that introduces a lot of uncertainty into the future. Uh, and then the, the continued threats of invasive species, uh, you know, I think we're still dealing with uh, the, the species that we have, things like sea lamprey, uh, really sort of a success story in uh, control of an invasive species, but also an ongoing uh, cost. You know, we need to continue controlling lamprey or the numbers will increase uh, and impact our fisheries. Uh, but things like uh, zebra and quagga mussel changes on the lakes, uh, round gobies, uh, how many round gobies are out there? What's eating round gobies? Uh, you know, if you're a, a fish that can really kind of shift over, and one of the things we've seen with uh, the whitefish, whitefish are able to feed on uh, the, the mussels, the zebra and quagga mussels. Not a great food source, but at least they have food out there. Uh, and then also seeing them shift into eating round gobies as well. So it's really some of these species that can take advantage of what's available uh, that might succeed into the future. Um, but yeah, uh, I think, you know, question marks into the future, but, you know, with sustainable management, uh, you will have fish to eat into the future. And that's, uh, that's what I've got for uh, sort of a, a very brief overview uh, of the uh, the commercial fishery. Well done. Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Emma Weirma. I'm from the UW Wisconsin Stevens Point Northern Aquaculture Demonstration Facility. For those of you who don't know where that is, that's up in Bayfield, Wisconsin. Um, I'm, my, part, my position is also in collaboration with UW Sea Grant Institute, which is why I'm here today to talk about Wisconsin aquaculture. Um, again, this will be kind of a crash course in Wisconsin aquaculture. There's a lot to know. Um, I really want to give you the broad sense of it all. Um, a few topics that I'll highlight is really the importance of aquaculture, again, not only for Wisconsin and the Midwest, but what does that mean globally? Um, and then I'll highlight Wisconsin aquaculture industry. So as a consumer of fish or a provider of fish, what if you're buying a Wisconsin farm-raised fish, how is that really different than a fish raised overseas? Um, how was that fish raised? And you can be confident in knowing a Wisconsin farm-raised fish is a healthy fish. Um, it's got good quality, and you're supporting your local economy, um, just for that general public information on that. And then I'll go into the future of sustainable aquaculture for this state and for the future, you know, for the world. Um, I think this is a pretty powerful quote. Um, it talks about our global aquaculture production. Right now we're at 67 million tons. That's currently right now, or 2012, it's even higher now. And they are looking at it to be doubling in less than 50 years. So in 2050, it'll be 140 million tons. Um, and we can work together with the commercial fisheries to help meet this, but really aquaculture is gonna have to help meet this demand. Um, and that's a huge number. Um, so not only is aquaculture needed for um, our global demand for seafood, but also it's, uh, it fits well in with agriculture. Um, this graph, if you have not seen this before, talks about um, the feed conversion factors for various agricultural products and compares that with fish. Uh, the circles above show the poundage of food needed to create one pound of mass for that animal. So for cattle, 6.8 pounds of feed are needed to create one pound of mass for, for cattle. Pigs, it's 2.9 pounds of feed. For chickens, it's 1.7. And for fish, it's only 1.1. Now this is talking about salmon and salmonoids, but generally that's about one pound of feed per pound of body mass. So it really makes sense to be raising fish, especially for from a food standpoint. Um, so Wisconsin history in aquaculture. Aquaculture has really been around Wisconsin for a long time, um, over 100 years, which is surprising to many people. And the first record, record was back in 1856. So it's been around a long time. It's a very diverse industry. Um, we have a very strong bait and game fish industry here, um, and that is really supporting our sport fishing industry here. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, the pictures I have here are Gollins Bait and Game Fish Farm. They're located in Dodgeville, Wisconsin. They're on their third generation uh, at this farm. 
Um, they are the largest bait fish producer in Wisconsin, um, if not perhaps the Midwest as well. So when you think of a Wisconsin fish farm, where is it in Wisconsin? Well, if you look at the map on the right, they are all over the place. Um, but what might you think of a fish farm may not be what is registered as a fish farm. Um, currently there is over 2,600 fish farms in Wisconsin. Um, but most of these are hobby farms, small family farms, or maybe not even a farm at all. Um, technically to be registered as, as a fish farm, you're raising fish for some reason. If you have fish rearing in your pond for any reason, you should technically be a fish farm. Um, so basically about 80 of these are actually commercial. They're raising their fish, they're selling their fish. Um, but only a dozen is a large scale. What would you think of as a large scale for a fish farm? And a new up and coming is aquaponics. So if you haven't heard that term before, it's raising fish and plants in the same system. So you're feeding the fish, they're producing waste. That waste is being broken down by beneficial bacteria and into something that plants can take up, such as nitrate. So it's a natural system and it's a recirculating system. So that water is being recirculated back to your fish. Um, just one statement about aquaponics, your primary product is your plants. Uh, fish are kind of a secondary product that you're getting, um, but it's still raising fish. So what is the economic impact of Wisconsin's aquaculture industry? Um, about 14 million in annual sales, um, 21 million in economic activity, and it's supporting over 400 jobs, about 441 jobs. And this is increasing all the time. So aquaculture is the fastest growing segment of agriculture. So we're always seeing this being increased. Um, Wisconsin's ranking, um, we are number 20 in the United States for aquaculture products. We're number nine for US trout production, number six in game fish production like walleyes, um, number two in bait fish production, and we are number one in the Midwest for aquaculture products, and that's out of our nine states, which is a pretty big deal for us. So how are fish raised in Wisconsin? Not too many people, you know, they buy farm-raised fish, but they have no idea how they were raised. Um, number one is for ponds. Um, that's probably the most common in Wisconsin. Uh, ponds range anywhere in size, but generally they're about one to two acres in size, and most of them are man-made, and they are drainable, so they were created for aquaculture specifically. Um, secondly, our raceways. So this is kind of an older way of fish farming. They've been around for a long time. Many state, tribal, and federal hatcheries still have raceways. Um, they are also known as a flow-through system. So all your water enters at one end and exits at the other. There's no reusing of water in a raceway. Um, but they are effective at raising fish. Um, a new and up-and-coming, well, not so necessarily new, but maybe a little bit newer for Wisconsin, is called recirculating systems. It's also known as recirculating aquaculture systems, or RAS. Um, you'll probably hear it referred to as. And this is the ability to reuse most all of your water. So most of the systems that we work with are about 95 to 99 percent of water reusage. And how we're doing this is we are being able to settle out our solids or filter our solids out with a drum filter and then we run it through a big biofilter, and that's a natural way of clarifying your water, so you can clarify that biologically with beneficial bacteria um, and send it back to the fish in the fish tanks. Um, we're looking forward to learning more about these systems for Wisconsin. Um, I'll talk about it later, but there's a lot of regulations for water usage, so being able to reuse your water is, is going to be huge. And aquaponics, so I mentioned raising fish and plants together in one system. Um, again, you're being able to reuse your water and that's becoming a huge interest also in Wisconsin. Um, a big question that I get a lot are what do you feed your fish? What is the aquaculture fish fed? Um, there's a couple of different things. One, the first is bait and generally bait is fed to fish that are pond reared for stocking. So if you are raising walleye for restocking, um, you're feeding them bait fish um, bait is pretty expensive, so you don't want to raise it as a commercial for commercial fish production, but if you're restocking fish, it's basically what we feed them. If you're feeding fish for production for a food fish, you're going with commercialized pelleted feed. Um, there's all different types of commercialized feed, um, all different brands. Um, the picture at the left, we have to feed train. We have to feed train fingerlings in order to accept something like a pellet feed. So the larval fish here is a walleye, and we start them off as soon as they hatch out, they're looking for food um, within three to five days. 
Um, you can see that his, his belly is pretty full. He's accepting feed. Um, we get him going on something called otohimi. Um, tastes great to them. It looks great to them. has fish meal in it, and they're accepting this. Um, the picture at right, it's hard to see it. Um, but this is our broodstock walleye, and they're, they've been feed trained at a young age to eat commercialized feed. Um, so again, this is for the production for food fish. Um, to go into a little bit more detail about commercial feeds, a lot of people say, well, what's in fish food? What's in that commercialized feed? Well, here is a picture taken right off of one of our feed bags at the facility. Um, this is for our trout broodstock. Again, there's all different feeds. There's a lot of research done on what kind of nutrients are put into feeds to make that fish grow the fastest, be the healthiest. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out is there's protein, fat, and fiber, and that's all looked at very carefully um, for different species. And for a broodstock, maybe the fat content would be a little higher. Um, and they, they come in all different sizes. Again, this one is 6.4 millimeters in size. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is pigment. Sometimes our feed has pigment in it. This certain pigment is canthaxanthin. Um, we have also have another pigment that's called astaxanthin. Uh, these are both FDA approved pigments and they are antioxidants pretty much. So these pigments are naturally found in things like shellfish, like zooplankton, um, in crustaceans. So the fish is naturally getting this in the wild. And so it's an antioxidant for them for their health, but also it helps with pigmentation in the flesh color. So when you eat an Atlantic salmon and it's kind of a bright, nice flesh color, it's probably because the pigment has been in their feed. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That's a positive thing. Um, you can actually find these pigments at a health food store for human consumption as well. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is fish meal. There is fish meal in fish feed, um, in certain fish feeds. Uh, fish that are more omnivorous, like tilapia, you might um, have a feed that has more plant-based protein or a soy protein. But trout and um, fish like walleye, they're looking, they want a fish meal in their feed, not only because of the scent or the smell, but the health of the fish. It's only natural that fish meal would be in a highly carnivorous fish. Um, and it, it's sustainable and it's certified safe. So what that means is the amount of fish meal that goes in here to produce many fish is quite small. And certified safe means that the PCB content and mercury content that could be in that fish meal at all is very low, and it's, and it's at a health and a safe level for us to be feeding our food fish. Um, so just going into that point a little more, a fish raised in Wisconsin is a healthy fish. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we're doing it sustainably. This is all land-based aquaculture I'm talking about today. Um, we're not talking about net pen aquaculture, so there's no intermix with wild species. Um, there's no disease transfer. Um, they're raised in a good water quality environment. And how do we know that? Well, if your fish gets sick, there's really not much you can do. Um, there's a few antibiotics that are approved for the U.S., but really they might not be that effective. They're expensive. So really, if you're a farmer in Wisconsin, you want to keep your fish healthy. You want to be monitoring them every day. Um, you want to be checking water quality, monitoring that. Um, overseas, for example, we have no regulation on how that fish is raised. A lot of times it is in a poor environment, and what they do is they give an antibiotic to them, and they just keep, probably keep giving them antibiotics because it's not regulated over there. Um, here it is, and generally we don't have to use it, and we don't use it. Um, so a healthy fish is, you see good growth in a healthy fish because that's, that's what happens, and that means profit. So of course that's what we want, that's what we want to see, plus we know it's a healthy farm-raised fish. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few bottlenecks that we see in the industry. Um, our facility works directly with a lot of farmers and we see some of these limitations and bottlenecks. Um, one of these being very strict permitting and regulations for farmers. And it makes very farmers, it's very difficult for them to advance um, or to just sustain their farm. Um, it's just, it's very unfair. And what I'm talking about is their water usage and their effluent. So aquaculture and agriculture should be in the same category, but it's really not. Aquaculture is very regulated by the DNR, not so much DATCAT, Department of Agriculture. Um, there is new legislation out currently right now with a bill being looked over to make aquaculture part of agriculture. And all that means is pretty much leveling the, the playing field. We're not saying that all of a sudden aquaculture, there will be no regulation for it. We're just hoping that this will really help advance the industry and help our farmers. 
Um, another bottleneck is competition with imported seafood. As Kathy mentioned, 90% um, of our seafood is coming from overseas, and only about 1% of that is actually inspected. So like I stated, we have no idea how that fish was raised overseas. When it comes to us, it's usually packaged, it's frozen, maybe it's looked over for fillet quality or flesh quality, but we don't really know where that came from. Um, and our farmers that are providing a really good, sustainable product, it tastes good, um, it's healthy, it's, it's well raised. We're competing with things like um, tilapia that's $2.99 a pound. And this picture is pretty funny to me because it says quality seafood. Well, it was previously frozen, it was a product of China, and if you really want to eat something that's been raised, processed, shipped over here, and frozen for $2.99 a pound, it's pretty scary to think what that fish had to go through. It obviously probably wasn't in the best environment. Um, so what we're really trying to push for is read labels. Um, a lot, what's been happening now is labeling is becoming much, much less strict, so companies don't have to label if they're from China, and, and um, the market here doesn't really, might not require it, so if you look at a piece of seafood and it's not labeled, it's pretty much you probably don't want to eat that because it's probably coming from overseas. And really we're telling our farmers, and, and they're doing a good job at this, is you, your market of premium product. You get what you pay for. So if you really want to eat that $2.99 a pound tilapia, then it's probably going to taste like a $2.99 tilapia from China. Um, another bottleneck too that's kind of associated with the previous slide is public education. A lot of people think farm raised and they think negative thoughts. Um, there's been a lot of media about net pen aquaculture and how that's a negative just a negative feeling. Well, farm raised here isn't the same as farm raised overseas. Um, farm raised in Wisconsin is, is sustainable, it's land based. So we just want to make sure people understand what that means, where their fish is coming from. We really want to promote locally raised or locally caught, um, either one, and promote sustainability for sure. Um, the pictures are of our local schools, so our facility has helped to incorporate aquaponics into local schools so students can raise fish and they can raise vegetables and not only are they learning from these, they can incorporate their classes with aquaponics, um, they can look at biology, technology education, they can look at marketing and business um, and also they can have a fish fry at the end of the year. So our facility is really promoting that and students are learning this at an early age, not only what aquaculture is but how to be sustainable. Um, another big bottleneck that people don't really think about is workforce education. Um, this industry is exponentially increasing and investors are looking for workers. Um, and it's not, it doesn't mean you're experienced if you go to school and get a degree in this. It's really about experience. So hands-on education is huge. Um, and they're in such high demand. So it's surprising, but one of the largest threats to new facilities is poor management. So a new investor will come in, hire some, somebody that has a degree in this, but has never raised a fish before in their life. So we see a lot of issues with that. So what we're doing at our facility and what we're promoting is getting hands-on education. Go to a fish farm um, if you want to be in this business and work there for a while before you start to be in anywhere near management. In our facility, we do a lot of hands-on training and education. Um, so we are constantly training workers and giving them out to the industry. Um, one last bottleneck is the fish themselves. Uh, so many times raising fish might not be the issue, it's actually making a profit. Um, so some species might be good at a small level, a local level, or urban markets, but as soon as you hit commercialization of that species, that might not make you the profit that you thought. Um, availability of eggs or feed trade fingerlings. Um, if one company is providing eggs or fingerlings and all of a sudden, you know, they go out of business or they quit doing that species and change to a different one, that's, that was your main income. That was where you were getting your eggs. Um, so we talk about bio plan, know your species. And definitely have a backup plan. Literally don't put all your eggs in one basket. Make sure that you have a couple different um, companies that you can order from as a fish farmer. Um, I talked about our facility a little bit throughout the presentation, but I just wanted to highlight our mission is promoting education and obviously advancing sustainable aquaculture. And we do this a number of different ways. Um, we're basically focused on Wisconsin, but we have partners across the Midwest, even internationally. Um, but we have projects and partnerships. Our partnerships are state, federal, tribal, private. Um, we've got organizations partnered with us. We've got hatcheries, farms. 
Uh, workforce education is a big deal for us, so like I stated, we always have interns coming in. Um, we're hiring new hires all the time, and then we are providing them to the industry for that um, hands-on education. Technology transfer. Technology in this industry is always changing. It's always advancing. Um, we are testing technology at our facility um, just to know what works, what's efficient, and then we can transfer that to the industry as well. Um, a key thing for us is all of our research and projects are very relevant and we are working directly with farmers to know what, what do they want. Do they know, want to know about a certain species or a technology? Um, we have about eight projects going on right now. We have eight different species at the facility right now. So we try to make this relevant. We're trying to directly benefit the industry. Uh, where are we headed for aquaculture? Um, like I mentioned before, being able to reuse your water, so recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, again, land-based, they're sustainable systems. You can reuse 95 to 98% of your water. Um, partial recirculation is a new and up and coming as well. We have a lot of farmers in Wisconsin that are looking into partial recirc. Um, it's not so much capital cost. You might not mean, need a drum filter or a biofilter, but you can settle your solids out with a different tank setup and system. And to a farmer that they are capping out their water, they're using as much water as they can, but they still want to advance or um, expand, there's really nothing, not much they can do. So they have to look into being able to reuse some of that water. Um, capital costs might be a little higher, but your profit could be faster or is faster. Um, there's things you can control like your temperature, your water quality, um, and you can see your fish directly. You know, in a pond that might be more difficult, you can't control things like temperature. Um, predation, things like that. In an indoor system, you can do that. Um, and there's a greater species selection as well. So you can look into species such as Arctic char. So this picture is a one-year-old char. We were able to get to market. We we're working with a private company with them. Um, in research, we could get them to market in one year without recirculation systems. If you can't control things like temperature and water quality, it might take twice that long or even three times that long. Where else are we headed? Well, the local food movement. Just like today and tomorrow, tomorrow's local food summit, there's been a really big push for this, which is great for Wisconsin aquaculture. Um, technology advancement, like I said, it's always improving, it's always advancing. Um, we're here to test that and to transfer that to the industry. Um, new promising species for food fish. Um, this is a picture of Atlantic salmon that we're working with. Um, so that's becoming a new and up-and-coming species uh, for Wisconsin. So we can, we're looking to raise Atlantic salmon in Wisconsin for the industry. Um, so that will be huge. Arctic char is a big one as well, and sagai, like Kathy mentioned. So sagai is a cross between a female walleye and a male sauger. And the reason we like to see walleye for a food fish is we see that they grow almost twice as fast as walleye. So from a food fish perspective, they're a really good species. Uh, workforce development um, for conferences, workshops, from our facility, we're really trying to get people out there, get people hands-on experience. And there's a lot of different research agencies out there. Um, NICRAC is the North Central Region Aquaculture Center, um, WAA, Wisconsin Aquaculture Association, U.S. Trout Farmers, uh, UW Sea Grant Institute, we put on today, um, and our facility, NADF. Um, there's resources out there to really advance this industry in Wisconsin, and definitely if you're a farmer or if you want more information, contact those agencies. That's pretty much all I have for you today. Um, if you want more information on us or our projects, anything, um, our webpage is aquaculture.uwsp.edu. We also have brochures in the back, and if you have any questions for me, you can grab me anytime. <laughs>